Hello, I'm Dr. Stephen Parr. I'm an emergency medicine physician at Tradition Medical Center. I'm also the ED medical director here at Tradition. And I'd like to talk to you today about heroin overdose and what it's like for a patient who comes in as a heroin overdose. So uh, the first thing, the first problem that we have is often nobody knows what anybody has injected into themselves. Um, and often the person injecting doesn't know what, they, what they've injected themselves because it can have you know, any kind of adulterants in there, even, you know, even things as odd as strychnine, just so that people feel different when they get it and they, you know, they feel like they're getting high. But the most recent uh, media attention has been to the, the very high potency opiates, fentanyl and carfentanyl, uh, with fentanyl being a medication that we use more in anesthesia and more in a trauma setting. Uh, to help people with pain is, uh, I think, a hundred times more potent than morphine. And so it's got, it's got a really narrow, what they call a therapeutic window. So it means that a little extra of it can be way more than you're used to and can, can actually kill you. The other problem with it is it's also super highly addictive, even more so than heroin. And then the carfentanil is, I think, a thousand times more potent than heroin. And, uh, and they use that as an elephant tranquilizer. So the people who are selling heroin are cutting that into the heroin to give people a better high so that people seek out that medication because they think it's gonna get them, you know, get them more high. The problem is that there's inconsistent dosing and you know, people aren't used to, to using that medication. And so it's really easy to overdose on that medication. So, and that's, that's what we deal with here in the emergency department is the people who have overdosed. So sometimes it's an unintentional regular heroin overdose. Sometimes somebody puts something in the heroin and it's just a, a hotter dose than the person is used to. And the problem with that is that in addition to the high that they get, it also cuts off your brainstem response to low oxygen levels and high carbon dioxide levels. So what that means to the person who's overdosed is that they, they're unconscious, they can no longer actively breathe for themselves, and their brainstem no longer cares if they breathe, and then that causes them not to have any, any oxygen in their blood and too much carbon dioxide, and that can kill off your brain. So, uh, so usually the way that somebody presents here, if, if that happens for a long time, of course, they die. Um, if, uh, if it happens for an unknown period of time, then either they, they have you know, brain damage or if they're lucky and somebody finds them in a short period of time, then the paramedics respond and we try and give them a reversal agent called Narcan up front. The Narcan competes with the heroin and it will actually, uh, it's actually almost like the Uma Thurman scene in Pulp Fiction where they just magically kind of wake up when you get it assuming they aren't on one of the really high potency uh, opiates like fentanyl or the, the elephant tranquilizer, the carfentanil. So, so the paramedics give them that medication. If they, if they wake up immediately, then a couple of things happen. If you're, if you're on heroin, a lot of the time people are using heroin so that they don't end up going into withdrawal. And the withdrawal symptoms from heroin, they make you feel like you're gonna die, but you, you, you won't. It's actually not a life-threatening withdrawal syndrome. But what happens is you start having you know, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea is the biggest part of it. And you know, while uh, the heroin is making you feel good, it's, it's hitting all those, those uh, euphoria symptoms and you know, we use it to treat pain. When you reverse all of that, then all of a sudden everything hurts. Uh, even, a, even a sheet laying on top of a patient hurts. And that's while they're usually actively vomiting in the floor and, and they almost immediately start having diarrhea. So, all that's the really unpleasant side of, you know, of re the reversal agents. If they're on a high potency reversal agent, then one of two things can happen. One, the paramedics may not realize that they, they really are a heroin overdose because they didn't respond as we typically see with, um, with the reversal agents, or they, they can, uh, the, the heroin, the high potency heroin with the fentanyl in it can overpower the reversal agent and they get repeated sedation. So those people may require higher doses of the reversal agent. So if, for example, we might normally give somebody 0.4 milligrams of Narcan, which is not a really big dose of, of Narcan, but if they're on a fentanyl dose, uh, fentanyl-laced heroin, they may require two to 10 milligrams of, of uh, Narcan to reverse the, to, to reverse the heroin. And, uh, and not, it's not uncommon that we actually have to take Narcan and put it into an intravenous drip and run that into the patient to keep them from having repeat sedation. So uh, the other things that happen are that uh, you know, people who inject heroin, 
it's it's generally very bad for your veins to do that over a period of you know, months to years and they a lot of them don't have any veins left over so if you're lucky the paramedics can actually find a vein to be able to start an IV to be able to give you a reversal agent uh, fortunately if they can't do that we actually have uh, an, uh, a nasal atomizer where they can actually spray it up into your nose and that medication gets on the skin inside your nose and you can actually reverse heroin you know, by that pathway. But if they end up here, uh, especially if they're on one of the high dose, uh, high dose opiates, we're not gonna be spraying fentanyl into somebody's nose every time they, you know, they stop breathing. It's just not a really professional way to handle it. And if somebody doesn't notice that, then they can actually quit breathing and they could be harmed. So what we have to do is we have to get some kind of uh, vascular access. So, uh, so if they didn't have a breathing tube put down their throat to begin with, they may end up on a ventilator here with a big plastic breathing tube down their throat. And, um, and then the other thing we have to do, if we can't get uh, an intravenous line in one of their you know, arms or legs or hands or feet or their neck, then, uh, then we'll take a, uh, a central line is what we want to, what we want to use. So we'll, we'll take a, a, a needle that's probably about four to five inches long and you stick it up underneath their collarbone and you, you know about where their subclavian vein is and you put the needle in while you're pulling back on the plunger until you start getting blood back. Once you get that, you can take that off, and if blood's squirting out, then you know you're in an artery and you have to start all over. If there's just dark, dark red blood dripping out, then you know you're in a low pressure vein that doesn't have a whole lot of oxygen in it. And then we, the process for that is that you run a wire into that vein, pull the needle off, take a knife, cut through the skin, and then there's a dilator that you use to stretch out the hole in the skin and stretch out a hole in the vein and then we've got a big catheter that we can run in under their collarbone into the center of their chest so now that we've got a secure line so we know that those life-saving medications are going to get into their circulation and they'll get into their circulation immediately so in general that's you know that's how a patient presents to the emergency department and how they get treated in the emergency department and then after we manage that uh, they may end up being admitted to the hospital, and if somebody has hit that point in their life where they're they're so addicted to these drugs that they're a, a threat to themselves, then you, we actually may have to take away their right to leave the hospital. So one of the things that we have in ho in, in Florida is something called uh, a Marchman Act, and a Marchman Act means that someone is a threat to themselves or others because of a substance abuse problem, and because of that that threat we have the ability to take away their right to make decisions for themselves for up to 72 hours. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll invoke a Marchman Act, which is a legal process that allows us to take control of that person, and then we can send them for involuntary detox. So we can send them to a facility where they'll help them go through all those withdrawal symptoms over a period of several days and keep them from you know, having access to you know, heroin or any other kind of opiates that would, you know, would keep them addicted. And uh, of course, that's a that's a very you know difficult process. Often there's limited resources, so it's not like somebody you know comes in as a heroin overdose, gets admitted to the hospital, they're better in six to twelve hours, and then you know less than twenty four hours they're going to a detox facility. Usually that's a process that takes several days. And if um, if a Marchman Act runs out, if it terms out on that seventy two hours then we'll have to reassess them and we can invoke another Marchman Act and actually keep them longer than, than 72 hours.